when it, it will tell you before then. Okay. You go ahead, Madeline. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to share my experience with you and um, with the board. Um, my name is Madeline Levy and uh, I'm 32 years old. I've got a diagnosis of Asperger's, um, which is a form of autism. And I've also got social anxiety, general anxiety and depression. Um, my links with Great Vine is that I studied an occupational therapy degree at Coventry University. Um, and I'm due to graduate from that at the end of March. So uh, I've been living in Coventry on and off for the past three years. Um, I'm really passionate about making changes and improving services and systems for um, people with learning disabilities or difficulties because I feel that not a lot is done in collaboration with these people, even though we're saying that the services are for them and are about them. And I think the more we understand their experiences and the more we include them in services, the better we can uh, bring about change for them and change that they actually want to meet you. And I guess um, what you guys are interested in is um, the diagnosis process because um, that is ultimately the first time that people have uh, a dialogue with services. Um, for me, I was diagnosed when I was eight years old, so that was 98. Um, and I remember feeling quite frustrated even as a child because I didn't understand what the assessments were for. Um, I remember feeling quite cross at just being asked to play with some blocks and it caused me a great deal of anxiety and then uh, after that it caused me to have battles with my self-esteem and self-worth. Um, I think to be fair to the people who diagnosed me because um, I've recently met up with them in my adult years to discuss this process with them. Uh, what they did do well was that they had a play centre there and um, they were very kind and genuine people. But what I think they could have improved to person-centred care then if they'd have um, found out about my learning style and maybe provided me with some booklets about the purpose of the assessment talk to me a bit about the purpose of the assessment in a way that I could understand then I would have felt that they were truly listening to me and that they were um, not just professionals who were going about their day-to-day -day duties and um, I think it's really important to have a strengths-based approach a lot of the diagnosis uh, bits are done based on the medical model of disability and that very much focuses on people's deficits and um, if you do that then you'll never know the person truly because you're telling them what they can't do rather than um, meeting them in the moment and working with them on what they can do. Um, and I think this goes nicely into preventing hospital admission or uh, preventing people from being moved into the wrong care settings because I think that if you get to know the person, if you build a relationship with them over time, then you'll know what their true needs are and what they require out of the service. I do understand that that's not always possible because after having completed an occupational therapy degree, I know the strains that there are on services. I know that clinicians have caseloads of 60 um, service users. Sometimes I know that there are time pressures, etc. 
but I think we can go right back to the beginning and get things right in the first instance. So think about the type of experience the person's having when they first come into your building or into your um, assessment center. Are they being listened to? Are they being treated with kindness and respect? And are their personal preferences being uh, taken into account? So for example, if they live in Coventry, um, don't send them to a care setting in Warwickshire, for example, because that's far away from their support networks and their friends and their family. And they may not drive, so it might cause some anxiety being a long way from friends and family. In terms of service development, I think there is a lot that we're doing right, but I think that um, there's a lot that could also be improved as well, particularly communication um, between services. So, for example, if you've got somebody who has been to lots of different services and needs some um, a multidisciplinary approach to support, then if every professional who they come into contact with reads their notes, for example, knows all of their preferences, their likes and their dislikes, knows what their favoured activities are um, before that person enters the next service, then it saves a lot of time firstly because you're not having conversations over and over again and it makes the person feel valued and makes them feel like they're being listened to. Um, and then once we've got that right, we can move from there. I think knowing people's access needs are really important as well because having to explain those over and over again is really difficult. Um, I did some work with Open Theatre Company, Coventry, Coventry and Birmingham, and they're a theatre company for young people with learning difficulties or disabilities. And they have a document which is called an Access Rider document. On that document, they record um, every access need that person has, be it from right from needing uh, regular breaks because of concentration and um, right the way through to how they want to be paid for their work if they are being paid for their work and what that document does is it provides the start of a conversation so that people can explain their needs to you and then they can move you can move forward from that conversation to find the service that works for them um, when services don't communicate with each other, um, I found this very difficult personally. So um, when I went on placements, for example, I had a member of staff from Coventry University who would meet with me before the placement. We'd document my uh, needs and then we'd pass those needs on to uh, whoever the practice educator was on that placement setting. Um, I have quite a few access needs. I have had two spinal operations, so I can't lift any more than five kilos, for example. Um, and I have travel anxiety. So when I travel from place to place, I need a bit of support with planning routes and I might need um, taxi support, for example. Um, when this wasn't communicated uh, over COVID-19, I was working in a GP practice in Burton-on-Trent and um, this was at the height of COVID, the second lockdown in uh, December 2020. And not only did my practice educators find it very difficult to work with me, but I found it difficult to communicate and work with them. And this caused chaos in running the service. So if that's from 
me who's on an occupational therapy course, imagine how difficult it is for somebody who may be non-verbal um, and may be uh, wheelchair reliant to explain to somebody their access needs if they're not uh, properly communicated and documented by health professionals. Um, I think it's really important for the CCG to build um, accessibility into the way that they design services um, and also to um, for the LDA to uh, bring things that have been discussed in this meeting into um, service behaviours. So, for example, um, I worked with a trust in Birmingham who had positive behaviour and compassion and empathy as their um, top behaviours in the service. And when that was truly applied, you could see the difference in the working environment. Staff were kinder to each other. They included the service users in the decision-making process. They collaborated with service users to help develop their um, and expand their ideas for uh, therapeutic relationships and interventions. And the service users really felt the difference and they said that the behaviour was positive and it inspired and uplifted them and improved their health and well-being to know that they were actually truly being listened to and included by professionals. Um, I think sufficient training for staff and managers is essential. So at the moment, most universities who offer courses like occupational therapy, nursing, physio, um, the new physician's associate roles, they only offer very limited um, training on uh, autism, mental health, etc. cetera. Um, and what that does is it leaves us with a society and a body of clinicians that don't value people um, with these needs and experiences. Um, it's not enough that the government has now uh, developed some training uh, to understand autism because this isn't mandatory at the moment and anybody could meet somebody with autism if you work in a client pacing role, you never know when you're gonna meet somebody with Asperger's. So I think it's essential that everybody who works in a customer phase and role has this training and they're trained on how to recognize um, when people have special interests or when people have sensory needs, etc. So for me, um, There's been a bit of an overlap between uh, my professional and my personal life for um, mental health. So uh, because I studied occupational therapy, uh, but I do have uh, mental health needs, it can be difficult for healthcare professionals to get that support that they that they need to, um, you know, to feel that their mental health needs are being valued in society or even by their colleagues. And it can be quite hard for them to ask for support because as we've seen with COVID-19, people have been working tirelessly for the last couple of years. And if there's no mental health support in place for them to talk about their frustrations and their difficulties within their job role, then they might become frustrated and agitated with the people that they're supporting. And that leads to a lack of understanding and a lack of communication between both parties. So there needs to be very tailored specific support, both for people working 
to support people with mental health conditions or autism uh, and for those people themselves and their needs are going to be very different. I think um, if people are committed to employing neurodiverse people in healthcare roles, for example, then they need to be committed to making reasonable adjustments for people. And to be honest, I think that everyone should have reasonable adjustments in the workplace. It's not just people with autism who need those adjustments. There could be some people in your organizations that are struggling, but you don't know because they find it difficult to communicate with you or they don't want to be thought of as weak or ineffective at their jobs, et cetera. And I think that leads very nicely on to um, managing people's expectations. As I've said, I do understand the time constraints that are in place for professionals. I do know how hard everyone's worked over the last couple of years. I know that caseloads are massive, et cetera. But in order to make your services work, communication is key. You need to set expectations for people right at the beginning, not in a way that makes them feel like you're giving them a telling off or something, but so that they know what you have time for, what services you do provide and how you can support them effectively. And I think that communication, it's essential to somebody with autism, you know, informing them that you're not going to be able to change the fact that they have autism, but giving them a lowdown of the outcomes that you could support them with and the effective methods that you could use, the therapeutic interventions that you could use to help them with their lives, any coping mechanisms that you have in your toolkit to support them, then that will start on a better footing uh, with your building your relationships with them if they know that you know how to help them when their mental health deteriorates. Um, I hope that this has been useful for you. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Apologies that I couldn't be there in person. And um, I hope that this has given you something to think about when you're designing your services or um, going forward with further meetings. Uh, thank you very much for listening.